It's my pleasure to um, introduce to you and to reintroduce some of you to uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Tadani, um, a nephrologist, um, formerly of uh, Harvard, Mass General, uh, latterly Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. Uh, Ravi has spoken on vitamin D at this meeting in the past, at one of the first nephrology at the limits meetings in Cape Town, and <clears throat> gave an absolutely phenomenal talk then. I've heard him speak on the, in the field or related fields on several occasions since. This is a field that's quite tricky, it's broad, it's complicated by flat earth believers on both extremes of the argument, um, and those extremes have been pretty extreme at various times. So um, I think it's a highly appropriate topic for a meeting like this, and we've got the best possible man to give the, to give the address, Ravi. Great. Well, good morning. It's an honor to be part of the meeting, obviously the exceptional uh, speakers and the, and the quality of the presentations has really been an absolute delight. It is humbling to be able to speak uh, in front of this crowd and especially uh, in front of John, who himself, as many of you know, uh, is world renowned in this particular area. So I'll look forward to seeing if I can uh, push him a bit uh, to, the, to the limit, no pun intended. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. So John asked me to address the question, vitamin D panacea or much to do about nothing? And the answer to that question is yes, <laughs> panacea. For those individuals that suffered from this particular problem, whether it be a genetic defect or nutritional defect in vitamin D metabolism, the consequences to bone, short stature, metabolism, and others were essentially reversed, prevented, cured, if you will, with the replacement of vitamin D a field full of Nobel laureates, UV light, incredible biochemistry. We know this as by way of panacea. But yet we come full circle and we ask the question, much to do about nothing, question mark, and wonder how did we get to this point in our field? This trial, led by Joanne Manson from the Brigham, 2,000 units of cholecalciferol, 25,000 patients, randomized cancer outcomes versus cardiology or cardiovascular outcomes, really no difference in either over a five to six year period. This was a US worldwide or US study, but when you look at the data worldwide, whether you look at New Zealand or the UK or other parts of the world, similar results by way of cardiovascular diseases for the most part exist, and that is there's really no major difference observed. Now, well before this publication, of course, the vitamin D mafia had their press releases ready. That is, in this large randomized trial, if the results were positive, the answer by that community would be, see, we told you so. Alternatively, if the results were negative, which they turned out to be, the press release reads that this trial did not treat patients who had vitamin D deficiency. In fact, all patients had levels over 20 nanograms, a level I'll, I will come back to. And so it still remains, is this much to do about nothing or is there something here? So in the next few minutes, I'll just share with you how did we get to this point and how should we be looking at vitamin D specifically by way of its metabolism to gain more insight? So many of you are familiar with the metabolism of vitamin D, and I'll simplify this. The top portion of this particular figure has to do with diet and sunlight that we're all familiar with. And then the precursors going to the liver in a rather uncomplicated way for 25-hydroxylation. And then following the liver, going to our favorite organ, the kidney, where there's an activation of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to 125-dihydroxyvitamin D and subsequently, that hormone playing a critical role in bone, as well as absorption of calcium phosphate and suppression of parathyroid hormone. A metabolism that we know quite well, and a metabolism, again, that historically has taken us over 100 years to tease out. And we're still learning about this, as you heard the lovely talk from Miles Wolf yesterday on FGF 23. So when I began in this field, back in the mid-1990s, and I'll get back to Professor Cunningham in a few minutes, I came across this article in Nature Medicine, 
which is clinical research in the human condition, moving from observation to practice, from one of the heroes I have, which is Alfred Summer. And what Alfred Summer did, as many of you know, is he made observational findings published in The Lancet on the relationship of vitamin A deficiency and its consequences. And in this observational study that he published, he suggested that degrees of vitamin A deficiency were incrementally associated with increased mortality. But yet he writes in his Lasker award-winning Nature Medicine article, the initial report associating vitamin A deficiency with increased mortality was received with deafening silence. Well, many observational studies, of course, are. And it's no fault of the scientific community that there's just no time to pay as much attention to observational data as there are to randomized trials. So to the credit of Alfred Summer, he reminded us that you can't just stop at observations. You need to do randomized trials. And so with this, as a GPS in terms of how to move forward, the obligatory observation, biology, and randomized trials were essentially the route uh, that I decided to pursue. So one of the key messages Alfred Summer highlighted is that if you're going to study a deficiency, in this case, vitamin A, and in our case, vitamin D, you need to go to where the epidemic exists. You need to go to the populations that are most profoundly deficient in order to find whether or not there would be a potential benefit. So Alfred Summer did his trials in different parts, for example, in Southeast Asia. And I did my studies, or we did our studies, I should say, in nephrology. But it was premised on the work of John and his colleagues, highlighting the fact that in nephrology there is a rickets with profound bone manifestations, resorption of the phalanges, rugged jersey spine, brown tumors, and the like, that all could be prevented with therapies of vitamin D. The kidney was not working. 1,25-hydroxylation did not exist. And hence, there was profound deficiency of the actual hormone, 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D. And the consequences in nephrology were these amazing bone features, which today, thanks to work from John and his colleagues, have only been, or at least I should say, are now relegated to textbooks, these kinds of pictures. It changed the way nephrology was practiced. And today, around the world, we practice by using activated vitamin D to prevent these bone manifestations. We know that as kidney disease progresses, on the x-axis here, GFR going down, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, the nutritional form of vitamin D, and 125, the hormone, those levels go down. And simultaneously, parathyroid hormone levels go up. So one could only hope for a figure like this, and that is with the intervention, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, calcitriol, the native hormone, you get a profound reduction of parathyroid hormone. And as a result, the follow-up of this, of course, is the bone lesions are prevented. This is the biology of mineral and bone disorders in the world of nephrology. But of course, like all of us in the scientific community, we ask, what else is there? Panacea or much to do about nothing? And so we and others began to ask the question, well, is there not a relationship, not just for secondary hyperparathyroidism, not just for elevated levels of parathyroid hormone, but potentially a reduction in adverse consequences, primarily because vitamin D had been associated with so many different things. And so with these kinds of observational studies, that we did many years ago using these large databases, we asked the question, can't we move this needle forward to address biology and then clinical trials? We wrote many review articles, and of course, the link between the kidney and the heart is only limited by which meeting you went to. If you went to a meeting on oxidative stress, the link would be through oxidative stress. And of course, one of the links here at the bottom, as you see, is activated vitamin D. And there had been quite a bit of literature on vitamin D and the cardiac system. And hence, profound kidney disease, renal insufficiency, profound vitamin D deficiency, 
hormone deficiency and subsequent manifestations of cardiac disease in all its forms, atherosclerosis, uremic cardiomyopathy, and cardiac hypertrophy. In trying to get funding for a randomized trial, the most common question was, if you're going to do a randomized trial of vitamin D, activated vitamin D in dialysis, what's the mechanism that you're going to address? And I remember a meeting trying to get funding from the NIH. At the time, Peter's boss, Betsy Nabel at the NIH, said to me, great observational work, but you need to give us a mechanism. And so I went back to Boston at the time and began looking for models of cardiac hypertrophy. And in this case, resorted to the dull cell sensitive mouse or, and, and asked the question in this particular animal with high salt diet, given a volume or a pressure overload, could you reduce cardiac hypertrophy and necessarily demonstrate at least a proof of concept that we had a mechanism that could be applicable to the human model. And so we did these studies in animal models, the randomized trial equivalent, and demonstrated that indeed you could actually prevent cardiac hypertrophy, you could prevent cardiac failure. Now the dull salt sensitive animal, of course, is a model of volume, high salt, high volume. And so we said, well, which model should we go after in the human condition that would mimic best this animal model? And that is, should we go to the dialysis population or the chronic kidney disease population, thinking that maybe the mechanisms of cardiac hypertrophy may be slightly different between these two models? At the time, with all the observational data that were available, there were dozens of studies that actually suggested the treatment on dialysis was associated with improved survival. We did studies, and people from all over the world did studies, and it was very attractive, and hence the standard of care in nephrology among dialysis patients, first and foremost for bone disease, thanks to John, and secondarily for potential of cardiovascular benefit, the standard of care was the treatment of these patients. And it was quite widespread. So we raised about 20 million US dollars and we went to, from industry in this case, and we decided to do a study in dialysis patients. And the problem with that particular trial was after approximately 18 months, we enrolled about eight patients. And the challenge that we had was not that I would go and give presentations or colleagues of mine would go and give presentations and say, look at this interesting hypothesis. The most common response from the audience is, well, you need to do a randomized trial. When we commenced a randomized trial, nobody wanted to enroll their patients. And the reason being is because the observational data just kept on mounting from different parts of the world, different age groups, different races, different ethnicities. It all seemed to show the same result. Treatment with activated vitamin D was associated with lower mortality. Dozens of studies. Were we all wrong or were we all correct? But it could not commence in dialysis because clinicians refused to randomize their patients. And so we then went to the chronic kidney disease population before dialysis. And the question here was, is the mechanism of cardiac hypertrophy slightly different? One, it's rather universal as you get closer to dialysis, meaning cardiac hypertrophy. And two, the thinking is, do you do a trial at the end of this physiologic, pathophysiologic event, which is cardiac hypertrophy, and could you demonstrate reversal? Or do you do it at earlier stages and necessarily prevent progression? And I remember having conversations with people like Mark Pfeffer and others asking when would be the right time to intervene? Well, his group and others helped us put this randomized trial together for another $20 million in this case. And taking chronic kidney disease patients now in about 60 centers around the world and asking using MRI, cardiac MRI, could, you, could we reduce cardiac hypertrophy in a chronic kidney disease population? Targeting a cardiac abnormality in patients with kidney disease. And the final result, or the primary result, I said, I would say looks, or looked something like this. I remember giving this presentation at one of the renal meetings at the late breaking clinical trial session and showing this figure and the audience looking at this and saying, yet another trial in nephrology that just misses the level of significance. And when that question came to me, I had to remind the audience that it was almost significant in the wrong direction. That is, the placebo arm actually seemed to have gotten a better cardiac mass or lower cardiac mass, and the 
treatment arm actually stayed the same. So it was in the opposite direction. Now, like all clinical trials, when the primary result is negative, you begin to search, scramble, and pray for secondary analyses that at least show some effect. And yes, we did show, although not a primary endpoint in this study, we did show that there, was a fewer, there were fewer patients who were admitted for congestive heart failure among those patients that were treated. Exploratory needs further studies and such. Most recently, in the dialysis population in Japan, a study was published just a few months ago called the J. David study, where another form of activated vitamin D was given to patients on dialysis. And in this case, they didn't take patients actually who had secondary hyperparathyroidism, which of course would be a manifestation of vitamin D deficiency. They took patients who had normal levels of PTH and just gave them activated vitamin D or not. And over a 48 uh, a month period demonstrated no difference in the outcome. So, in nephrology, activated vitamin D, again, thanks to work from John and his colleagues, is used for bone disease. Does it help in cardiovascular disease? Probably not, although it wouldn't surprise me if we still continue to do studies in that circumstance. The management strategy would be to give that therapy to reduce PTH and the bone disease so long as the calcium levels don't go up, because remember, 125 increases absorption of calcium from the gut as well as from the bone. And that is the standard of care today. But the more common issue in our society, of course, is vitamin D deficiency, the nutritional form of vitamin D, and potentially this epidemic. So I go back to when I was a medical resident at Mass General, where a group of residents, myself included, <laughs> did a study where we looked at among inpatients in the hospital without kidney disease or liver disease, how common was vitamin D deficiency, and more importantly, at what level did parathyroid hormone levels go up? And in this case, as other studies had shown, in Boston, different seasons, accounting for diet, excluding kidney and liver disease, when levels were less than 30 nanograms, PTH levels went up. Now, this link between a nutritional deficiency, meaning a vitamin, and parathyroid hormone, if you will, allowed us and other people in the world to define vitamin D deficiency, not by a clinical endpoint, but by a biochemical endpoint, in this case, elevated levels of PTH. We could go around the world and just look at the frequency of 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels below 30 and assume that that would result, or more importantly, that would indicate vitamin D deficiency. Now, I'll make one comment, and that is this study was primarily done in Caucasians, and I'll come back to this point at the end. But using that metric, that barometer of deficiency, one can go to any part of the world, your favorite country, your favorite region, your favorite hemisphere, and begin to realize, or at least believe, that vitamin D deficiency is actually quite common. There's, in fact, no country in the world, based on that definition, that has a prevalence of vitamin D deficiency less than 20%. Most often it's greater. Even in places that one can think about where, where the sunlight, of course, is very common, like Australia and Southern California and so forth, you still find a prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. So John Cunningham came to Los Angeles a few months ago and he insisted that instead of spending time at our medical center and giving rounds and meeting the faculty that he should go to the beach and the reason he said that is because he wanted sunlight. And I said, John, why are you going to the beach to capture sunlight? He said, I'm vitamin D deficient. And I said, I don't think you're vitamin D deficient. I think it's much to do about nothing. And hence, that's the title of this particular talk. And he conveniently invited me to give this talk. So why do we have this epidemic? And more importantly, is it an epidemic? Well, you certainly are led to believe it's an epidemic if you read the lay literature. The New York Times, why are so many, so many people popping vitamin D? And again, with any internet search, you'll begin to realize that vitamin D deficiency is associated with almost every condition you can imagine. I thought this morning's talk was absolutely brilliant, both of them. The first one, Smoke and Mirrors, I thought he was going to talk about vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> that said, vitamin D has also been associated with weight loss, so, so it has not escaped other conditions as well. But it has been linked to many disorders, many diseases. And so it should not 
surprise you that people are taking it for their indication of choice. Now, I'm Indian, so I can say this, and that is in India, if you're deficient, the result of, like anywhere else, you say you need to replace the, the deficiency. But, again, I'm Indian, so I can say this, Indians tend to be zealots in one circumstance, and that is if a little bit is good, a lot more is better. This concept of toxicity <laughs> is not exactly one that, that we resonate with. So in India, you can actually get vitamin D at 50,000 units. Remember, the US recommendations and the UK guidelines would suggest 800 units a day. But you can actually get 50,000 units over the counter without a prescription. And of course, only in India would you find case reports like this, which is somebody taking a million units of vitamin D, developing nephrocalcinosis, calcification of the kidneys, kidney failure. So while it is rather a benign treatment, and more importantly, the therapeutic window is quite large, there are consequences of just taking too much. Now, why is this such a controversy? Well, if you look at tests and how much we spend for tests over the years from this laboratory report, the actual revenue from testing for vitamin D is somewhere about 1.3, 1.4 billion. This was back in 2010, and it's only gone up since then. Of note, at my medical center, to get a vitamin D level 25 hydroxy vitamin D, it costs $150. In Boston, when I was there, it was about $200. Of note, that's one laboratory test for 25-hydroxy vitamin D. One year supply of 800 units a day cost about $50. So you could argue, why do you need to check a level? If it makes you feel better, just take it. The therapeutic window is actually quite large. Now, the Institute of Medicine has certainly weighed in, as have other organizations, countries. And the evidence for vitamin D primarily rests in bone disease, osteoporosis, and especially in kidney disease. The most profound benefit, of course, is in bone disease. We'll come back to this point as well. So the NICE guidelines would highlight the following. That is, who should be treated for vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency? That is, treat for vitamin D deficiency if the levels are less than 25 nanomoles. That's about 10 nanograms. In the United States, we define deficiency less than 30 nanograms, but I think the UK has it right here. But then it says treat if the levels are in this range and the person has symptoms suggested of vitamin D deficiency. Well, I just told you, you can find any symptom that is linked to vitamin D deficiency if you searched hard and fast for it on the internet, that is. Headache, weight gain, depression, sore foot, belly pain, any symptom you can look for, or you will look for, you will link it to vitamin D deficiency. So in the last few minutes, let me just share with you the sort of full circle, and that is perhaps a better understanding of metabolism of vitamin D may help us understand some of this conundrum. <laughs> Most of us don't appreciate that vitamin D is actually carried by binding proteins. Vitamin D binding protein carries about 80% of circulating 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Albumin carries about 20%, and the free fraction is less than 1%. When you measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D or get a level measured, you are getting the total 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. You're not getting the fraction bound to D-binding protein or the fraction bound to albumin. You're getting necessarily the total. Now, vitamin D-binding protein has some very interesting properties. One, it has a very short half-life. Unlike albumin, Vitamin D binding protein is a half-life of a day or two. And also very importantly, it's a negative acute phase reactant. We know that in our, in our patients when they're sick, their albumin levels go down, but albumin has a half-life of 25 to 30 days. Vitamin D binding protein, alternatively, has a half-life of one or two days, so in acute illness, vitamin D binding protein levels go down. Now going to the kidney, just a short diversion, but I think it's helpful to understand. I'm going to show you two or three studies that just make this point more concrete. In the proximal tubule, there is a ligand-bound receptor, meaning cubulin and megalin, megalin in particular, that takes up vitamin D binding protein bound to 25-hydroxy vitamin D in the proximal tubule. When this is taken up, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is hydroxylated and 125 is generated and that works in the kidney as well as is then put into circulation. 
Now, megalin binding to D-binding protein, remember D-binding protein binds to almost 80% of your 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's a lipid soluble, so it doesn't circulate mostly in the free fraction. Megalin also binds albumin. Remember, albumin binds about 20% of your circulating vitamin D. When much of this or all of this is filtered, megalin and through that receptor takes up 25-hydroxy vitamin D and further metabolizes it. So I'm just going to show you two studies. One, the animal model where there's a megalin knockout and the animal model where there's a vitamin D binding protein knockout. And I'll just tell you the results because the figure is here, and that is when you knock out megalin, you lose both D binding protein and albumin in the urine, much of your 25 hydroxy vitamin D is lost, and you develop rickets. Alternatively, if you knock out vitamin D binding protein, because albumin still carries a reasonable portion, you don't develop rickets, you don't get vitamin D deficiency rickets, and your 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels may be low, but there is still enough because albumin is still intact. So the first study is as follows. In the megalin knockout, you see bone abnormalities in the animal, the null mouse, and you see D-binding protein in the urine, but you also see albumin in the urine. And these animals develop rickets. The megalin knockout loses albumin and D-binding protein in the urine and results in rickets. What about the D-binding protein knockout? The D-binding protein null mice do not phenocopy the megalin knockout, and the reason being is because albumin is still intact. But this is very important. So look at this animal. The animal that has no D-binding protein has very low levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D in the category of deficiency, has normal levels of PTH, normal calcium, normal phosphorus, normal alk phos. The animal null model has now been published in the human version, literally just a few weeks ago. In the New England Journal of Medicine, vitamin D binding protein deficiency and homozygous deletion of the GC gene, GC in this case being, of course, vitamin D binding protein. And what did that individual patient look like? The individual patient with no D binding protein had very low, if not undetectable, 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels, slightly higher PTH, but normal calcium, and no evidence of bone disease despite the fact that 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels were essentially non-existent. The heterozygous, normal PTH, normal calcium, 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels about 40, 50% lower than the normal, and D-binding protein less than half. So D-binding protein, quantitative levels of D-binding protein dictate 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels but because your body has alternate means to manage 25-hydroxy vitamin D, such as albumin and the free fraction, you don't end up getting deficient. And I'll just, for the sake of time, highlight that vitamin D binding protein is a negative acute phase reactant. So in the last two or three minutes, the question is, who should we treat for vitamin D deficiency? Well, this summary, just recently published, highlights a few points. And that is, one, the trials of vitamin D have gone up. Most trials have included only patients with normal levels. These are the number of trials by the levels. And the number of trials treating patients with very low levels, as per the UK guidelines and for the rest of the world, are very few. Most trials are primarily treating patients who are vitamin D sufficient. But Vitamin D binding protein is a negative acute phase reactant. And when you are sick, those levels go down. And as a result, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels go down. So does it surprise you that there have been trials in acute illness to treat vitamin D deficiency? These are three trials in sepsis. These are trials in pneumonia. These are trials in HIV. Vitamin D binding protein as a negative acute phase reactant is going to be low in these conditions. And as a result, those individuals are going to be vitamin D deficient, and then we would enter them into clinical trials. But if you look at patients in the ICU, which is what we did, and you followed levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D, these are about 25 patients followed over weeks, as those patients recovered, their vitamin D binding protein levels go up, and all of a sudden, they're not vitamin D deficient anymore. In fact, the treatment for vitamin D deficiency in the ICU is simply to wait wait until they get better. They're not necessarily deficient. And here are some patients, vitamin D binding protein going up, 25 going up, 
And we had an assay for bioavailable vitamin D essentially flat. And the same thing, D levels going down, D binding protein going down, and bioavailable or free levels essentially flat. Your body keeps bioavailable or free levels intact. PTH levels, I won't show you, were essentially normal. And what about qualitative differences? I showed you quantitative differences. Well, the qualitative differences would explain this. This paradox that in African Americans, where levels are low, PTH levels are normal, calcium phosphorus normal, bone mineral density high, and osteoporosis and fractures, some of the lowest among all races and ethnicities. But vitamin D levels are low in African Americans, yet their bone health is rather normal. And so studies like this highlight that there are qualitative differences in vitamin D binding protein, that is, genetic differences that explain potential differences in affinity and race. And that is, African Americans tend to have a particular isoform of vitamin D binding protein compared to Caucasians. And rather than go through the missense mutations and the point mutations of vitamin D binding protein, I'll just show you the following. That is, based on your genotype of vitamin D binding protein, your levels, normal, quote unquote, can be 15 versus 26, again, based on these isoforms of vitamin D binding protein. And if you look at the migration of us out of Africa and ask where do these polymorphisms leave us, well, the GC1F, which is associated with the lower levels or the lowest levels, comes to populations out of Africa that tend to have, at least the epidemiologic curves, the lowest levels of vitamin D, lower, again, compared to Caucasians. So if you look at African Americans in blue, the normal curve for 25-hydroxyvitamin D would look something like this. And in Caucasians, in red, it would look something like this. By definition, when an African American is born, she or he is defined as deficient compared to Caucasian levels. That's at birth, regardless of what she or he has done. And it is dictated primarily by the genetics of vitamin D binding protein. So the last slide, I'll just highlight the following. That is, we define deficiency based on Caucasian cut points around the world. Interestingly enough, I gave a talk once and I said, what if African Americans were the majority? As a result, the normal levels would be about 15 nanograms and Caucasians would be considered toxic because all of them had levels of 30 or above. But that, of course, doesn't go well in certain communities. That said, if we had assays that better measured bioavailable or free levels of vitamin D, perhaps we can better then define who's deficient, and most importantly then, who to treat. So I'll leave you with some of these conclusions, but I think I've highlighted, of course, the panacea or necessarily much to do about nothing. Thank you very much.